The Intel graphics series is a set of GPUs that have affected us all at least once in our lives, but how exactly did this series come into existence, and just how bad was it? This right here is an Intel chipset, also known as the Intel 810, a chipset variant incorporated onto most motherboards of the time, with the variant we have here being the 810E variant, one of the most common variants of the chip that most of us all know, although not the original form it existed in, a topic we'll be covering later on in the video. Released in 1999 under codename Whitney, it was included on many OEM offerings such as this tiny PC motherboard, and from what I can find includes a dual rendering pipeline, one shader mapping unit and one ROP while being able to utilize up to 11 megabytes of onboard SD RAM, or some boards which included dedicated VRAM on the board, which was actually quite a unique design, at the time at least. Of course it can function at 66 or 100 megahertz, regardless of FSB communication speed because it used a unique Intel hub design, a point that once again I'll cover in more detail later on in the video. Intel wanted to include as many features as possible, hence the support for varying bus speeds, two USB ports as standard, and an iGPU based upon the Intel 740 architecture, namely the Intel i752 which was released as an additional AGP 2x card that had very similar performance to this integrated chipset hence why it didn't last very long. As mentioned earlier, the chip also supports dedicated MPEG-2 decoding, which many of you guys will recognize as DVD playback, as well as digital video output, which was mainly reserved for workstation boards primarily. The basics like audio, AC97 and networking were included, and represented a large step up from competing chipsets at the time, but for the best performance you'd still have to use an add-in board. So why won't we put together a quick test system and talk a little bit more about how this series came to be. Originally released in 1997 under the name the Intel 740, it was Intel's first real foray into the somewhat usable graphics market, and was released as an add-in board, which you could actually go out and buy. You could go out and buy an Intel-based GPU, produced by three primary companies, namely Lockheed's Real 3D department, Intel, and Chips and Technologies. The Intel i740 was originally released to promote the AGP interface, as many competitors at the time, such as the well-known 3DFX, were still stuck using the PCI interface. However, performance of the chip was poor, even considering its price, which was really the main thing it had going for it, as the performance wasn't great, and neither was driver support for companies who really required a stable system. They offered it in bulk amounts for a low, low 35 US dollars, and that's really as good as it got. Trying to simplify this as much as possible, one of the core reasons it failed was that the RAM on the chip itself purely as a frame buffer for the display, allowing access to the system's main RAM to store all textures for 3D based applications. The concept that they were throwing around with the access times provided by AGP, which was what many reviewers of the time called a tremendous error on Intel's part, as the access times ended up being 8 times slower than comparative measures used by other cards of the time. The low end and Riva 128 was the main card it could compete with, which was soon replaced by the Riva TNT, which means that the card was stripped of even that low end title. The worst part is that some PCI variants of the card actually got made, featuring RAM added to them as they needed some for the bridge to convert from AGP to PCI would work and they still beat the AGP card in some performance tests due to the VRAM being present on the card. It wasn't long till Intel withdrew the card in August of 1999, only 18 months after the release of the card. Lockheed closed down Real 3D in the coming months with a few staff relocating to small contracts within Intel and many more turning to fellow graphics competitor ATI for jobs. However, while all this was going down, a few months prior to this in April 99, Intel had already announced that there was two new graphics chips on the way, namely the i752 and the i754 that we would all know to become the Intel 810, which would be later renamed the Extreme Series by its last iteration. Improvements made over the original 740 include support for multi-texturing, anisotropic filtering, and MPEG-2 decoding, as well as support for DVI displays, as mentioned earlier. The i754 was to feature a 4x AGP interface, and the i752 was to feature a 2x interface. 
However, the i754 was never actually released, but performance between the two variants was speculated to be very similar regardless of the bus connections used, purely because performance on the chip was so poor. Also something hard to verify is that the i752 was only released in small quantities, so checking the performance of that by itself is also very difficult for most people. However, the two cores ended up being used in the chips namely the Intel 810 and 815 chipsets, bringing us exactly back to where we started, with Intel having released an add-in board, which was then revised, adapted, and then later incorporated into a chipset, which is as minimalized as I can make this, but there's much more information available out there which I'll link in the description below. All boards with the chipset don't include an AGP slot, meaning that if you want to end up using a graphics card, it will have to be a PCI based one, which is not really ideal considering you've got a decently clocked Pentium 3 in here and an AGP graphics card could really help. The Intel Extreme chip doesn't actually support 32 bit graphical modes, forcing you to drop down to the normal 24 bits and all the way down to 16 bit if you want to run any 3D accelerated games, which never really helped with the reputation of the Intel Extreme series, because if you can get these games started, how well do they even work, and was it as bad as we remember? Firstly, we have the likes of SimCity 4, as the chip is way more than capable of running the older SimCity 2000 and 3000 perfectly fine, so I opted to try out SimCity 4, which ran somewhat okay, with the lowest settings in the 800x600 resolution, which doesn't look too bad, although higher resolutions would make the game stutter horribly and were completely unplayable. Provided you play the game like this, you saw an average of 31 FPS, with some okay frame times. Although the loading in some areas wasn't ideal and put the chip under heavy load, we did see 0.1% lows down to 12 FPS, which wasn't too common and didn't really detract from the experience too badly. Unreal Gold I gave quite an elongated test to, and we saw the game hover around 12 FPS on average, which was odd to say the least, and we could see sometimes higher FPS in larger open areas, which would hover around the 14 to 25 FPS region, which actually looks somewhat smooth, considering that most of the time in combat, our frame times cause us to have a stuttering mess of an experience, which wasn't great, but it was in line with what many people found with older systems like this, and even the Riva 128, which ended up having similar performance to this Intel based graphics card. Generally, this game was a no-go on our system, although I've been told if you tweak it down low enough it will run somewhat okay. Fallout 2 ran fine on a system like this, primarily as the only difference a display adapter like the Intel 810 makes, it's the output image quality, which on the Intel chipset is surprisingly nice. But considering the primary goal of this adapter was actually far from gaming and more for office based tasks, it's not too surprising that it's this good. I mean it's not matrox level, but it's not bad when it comes to output. And aside from a few bugs that can occur on the desktop, in games like these, it's really really nice to use. Either way, Fallout 2 was a great experience on the Intel 810 chipset. In a similar vein to Fallout 2, Oddworld's Abe's Odyssey looked and ran great, but the game is capped at 30 FPS and primarily relies on good video playback as well as decent output quality to look its best on any PC system, an issue you'll only really find on chips that are around this old. Either way, it was a perfect experience, it was on par if not better than the PS1 board of the game, purely due to that native VGA output. But moving forward to some 3D based gameplay, we had Quake 3 from 1999, running in the lowest settings in the 640x480 resolution, running on average with the benchmarks, we saw 36 FPS on average, 1% lows down to 28 FPS, and 0.1% lows down to 5 FPS during heavy action, which was mostly when there was a few characters on screen. Now the game did have some issues, the game starts using the wrong colour depth, which causes the game to do this. But after a quick system restart the game did run fine, but you do have to make sure the game is pre-configured to run on a system like this, otherwise you will run into a few issues. Following on from this, if you want to play an FPS game at a more fluent frame rate than Quake 3, well Quake 2 is available with the lowest settings in the 800x600 resolution, with an average frame rate going up to 47 FPS, with frame times that were admittedly better than Quake 3, and much better than Unreal. You could lower the settings further, but realistically the difference from dropping down the resolution to 640x480 compared to 800x600 wasn't much at all and hardly enough to warrant the impact it gave us in visual quality. However, this is about where things top out in terms of Quake 2 gaming. 
However, going back to the original Quake and older titles like that, they will run absolutely flawlessly on a system like this, as we've seen from the majority of older titles so far. With ones like this, generally sticking to the monitor's refresh rate of 60 FPS is generally the best way to play it, as uncapping this or forcing a higher refresh rate would often lead to far too many fluctuations in frame rate as it went up and down too rapidly, as we still ended up with those frame times which were alright, but were mostly due to dips with the performance of the game and weren't too bad when you capped at 60, but were much more apparent when you were running at a higher FPS. Grim Fandango is a classic game and definitely one of my favourites, and it's not too much of a challenge on all cards nowadays, even with the lowest settings in the lowered resolution of 640x480 the game looked nice, and we were hitting a nice average of 59fps with some ok frame times here or there. They were only really affected by camera angle changes, and even then at the worst case scenario it came down to 45fps, which isn't bad at all. Finally, to round us off, we have the likes of Civ 3 using the default options, which is all it really supports. Even so, we end up having 60 FPS on average, given the nature of the game, which isn't much of a surprise, but the quality on screen was nice, considering we were using a modern LCD panel. Newer Civ games would prove to be a bit of a challenge for a chip like this, as this was the last game to utilize such a basic display system for the graphics. But generally, any game that looks remotely like this, or uses a similar type of system, it should be okay for the Intel 810 series. So in conclusion, the Intel 810 series was a curse that many of us had to use. And hopefully most of us just use it for desktop usage as it's absolutely fine for stuff like that, and generally it can handle even basic web browsing nowadays, albeit a bit slow considering the systems it's usually paired with. But for the most part, we did try to game on it. And generally older simple 3D games do work, and more simple 2D games do actually work as well. But that's about as advanced as it gets. The newer 3D games may refuse to start, and older 3D games will definitely have some graphical issues due to funny driver support settings. That's only really if you don't know how to correct them, as most of them can usually be fixed by changing the color depth settings. Realistically, a large portion of newer games may work, but you will have to track down older versions of them due to small updates actually rendering the game unplayable. I mean, you look at half Life and it's a good example. You can run the disc version absolutely fine due to the fact it includes the direct 3D renderer, but do not even look at using the newer Steam version, as the performance on something like that will be detrimental and really, really poor. Realistically, growing up I used to use this for playing simpler games like LEGO Racers and the Command and Conquer series, and titles like that work absolutely fine on it. Your issues come from not being able to upgrade to a nice AGP based graphics card because of this chipset, like you can with other boards. An issue which, although not exactly common with the second series of Intel Extreme, was the case on some Intel OEM offerings. But that's a story for another video. Thank you very much for watching. Good night. So this little look back took a little while to put together as I tried to condense down quite a lot of information into a relatively short video and there's plenty more you can research in some links I'll put down below. You can always like and subscribe for more content like this or go and support us over on the Patreon.